Is it really possible to have a pest and disease resistant garden without resorting to pesticides that are poisonous or even organic pesticides? With companion planting, it is. I did several companion planting videos last spring and now it's fall's turn. Hey, I'm Brian with Next Level Gardening. If you're looking to join an online garden community that offers tips, tricks, and support to help take your garden to the next level, you're in the right place. Get started now by clicking subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss anything. Now let's get growing. If you watched any of my companion planting videos this past spring, then you know I am not interested, nor will I, pass on probably 80% of the companion planting methods that are passed around on Pinterest or all over the internet and in a lot of books. Most of it is nothing more than magic pixie dust and old wives tales. Let me know some of those methods that you've tried and let me know if they were successful for you or if you found them to be like many that I've tried all washed up. These methods are passed around like crazy and I'm not sure why there are so many new scientifically backed uh, ways of doing companion planting and old ways of companion planting that have been researched by, you know, the scientific agricultural community and be are proven to work. Those are all the ones that I'm going to be passing on to you on these videos. So at this fall planting time of year, let's focus on some fall planting companion strategies that actually work and that are backed by legitimate science. Now, let me put in my disclaimer again. I'm not saying that all old fashioned methods are wrong or they don't work. I'm saying if you wanna try them once, great, but do them on the side of these scientifically backed ones that actually have research to show that it works. Otherwise, it could be wasting your time and money. So let me know of any companion planting strategies that you've used in the past that either work or don't work. So we can all take advantage of that valuable information you'll find down in the comments. So let's go through some evidence-based companion planting strategies for the fall garden. There are not as many not near as many pests and diseases that occur in the cool season as do in your summer garden or the warm season. They're just, they just aren't around. So right there, our job is gonna be much easier. If you can incorporate some companion planting strategies though, it's gonna really take it to the next level. There are a few enemies that come to attack your plants in the fall. I would say the biggest one in my garden is uh, cabbage worms, green cabbage worms, cabbage loopers. They, without fail, every year arrive at some point during the season. Have you guys had those as well? I'm betting yes. I've touted BT in the past, and I still think it can be used on a spot treatment basis. Um, the problem with BT, BT is going to kill any type of caterpillar, worm, uh, pest, or beneficial, unfortunately, that it touches. And it is good at it. it it's like magic. The only problem with BT is it works so well and it does work on all larval type pests and beneficials. So a lot of our beneficial uh, insects start as larva, which will be adversely affected by BT. Um, it's great on all types of caterpillars. Unfortunately, it also kills some of our uh, valuable butterfly, uh, beautiful pollinators in the garden. Um, some extinct or almost extinct species like the monarch. And so it really has to be used sparingly, sparingly and conservatively. You don't want to just blanket spray your whole garden in hopes that if some caterpillars show up, they'll be killed. It's not the way to use BT. However, there are other ways to handle cabbage worms. Number one, just hand pick them off. It's really simple if you actually can just look for them. They are a little bit camouflaged, but you will find their uh, their poop or their chew marks. And they're usually not far away, usually under the leaves. And the reason they're such a big problem in the cool season is because a lot of our cool season crops like brassicas, which are kohlrabi, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, those all attract those worms. They love those plants and they can pick them out of a crowd. 
The first companion planting strategy to use is maybe you don't make it so easy for them to pick them out of a crowd. Intersperse all of your brassicas with other crops, and it doesn't have to be any particular crop. Any crop will do. The thing is, if a, a white, those white butterflies that you see fluttering around your garden, those are the ones that lay the eggs that become green cabbage worms. So they're very easily confused, fortunately. If they come over a hill and see your garden and you've got nicely laid out rows of cauliflower and broccoli and cabbage, super easy to spot. And they're going to land and land and land and land. And every time they land, they're going to lay their eggs. However, if you have a garden that has a brassica over here, a brassica over here, a brassica over there, interspersed with peas and carrots and every other type of cool season crop and flowers, which we'll get into in a minute, um, it's not going to be as easy for them. They're not going to be, they're going to get confused. And there is a, a scientific um, study going on. It, it's, it's been done and it, show, it shows that they might possibly have to land a specific amount of times on the right plant before they lay their eggs. And so if you intermix those plants, they're going to land on a cauliflower, then maybe a cauliflower, and then maybe a carrot. And that's going to confuse them and start the process over again. So you're going to get a lot less eggs laid just by interspersing uh, all your different plants together. Brassicas make it really easy for interplanting because they, um, they take up a lot of space. They take up a lot of space for a lot of time. It takes maybe six months for uh, to plant a cauliflower or broccoli or cabbage and have them move through to um, fruition until it's ready to harvest. And so it takes up a lot of garden real estate. So make the most of it by interplanting and interplant things that are lower. You know, brassicas tend to grow up tall and the six or eight inches off the ground underneath them is a perfect place to plant carrots, lettuce, um, radish, beets, so you're saving space and you're also confusing the pests as well. Now, a good enemy to attract into your garden that will devour uh, any type of larval pest, it does get beneficials as well. But this isn't so much like a BT where you're just spraying everything. This is allowing the natural course of life, the circle of life to happen in your garden. And it keeps a balance that BT or any type of chemical pesticide could uh, skew in one way or the other and just throw things off, throw the whole ecosystem off. If you can develop an ecosystem in your garden that works in harmony with nature, you're going to have a lot less work to do. So a big enemy of larval stage critters is the parasitic wasp. And parasitic wasps are very tiny. They don't typically sting humans. Uh, you probably won't even see many of them in your garden. But what they do do is look for larval stage creatures. So, you know, any type of caterpillar, uh, anything that starts as larva, which most do, um, it lays its eggs inside those caterpillars and the eggs develop inside the caterpillar, hatch out, eat the caterpillar from the inside, and eventually the caterpillar dies or the larva dies. So you want to attract the parasitic wasps to your garden. How do you do that? By planting dill and fennel in your garden, it's going to attract in parasitic wasps who will lay their eggs. They will sit there for a meal, have some of those pests, uh, and then their babies will also grow up and deal with them as well. Another big, I would say the second biggest uh, pest when it comes to brassicas are aphids. There are a couple of ways that you can keep aphids at bay through companion planting. Number one, plants like alyssum and cosmos will actually attract in the beneficial insect, the hoverfly. Now, hoverfly larvae, they consume aphids at a massive rate, more than ladybugs. So by planting those plants among your brassicas and your whole garden, really, it's gonna bring in the hoverflies whose larvae will devour so many aphids every single day, it's crazy. The same plants will attract ladybugs who are gonna do the same thing also. Now, nasturtiums are a great trap crop, and what they do is they lure pests away, like aphids, who actually like to eat them more than they like to eat your main crop. So plant nasturtiums around your garden, and the reason I love nasturtiums is the turnover rate is very high. They grow very fast, start to bloom very early, so when one plant is covered with aphids, 
take the whole plant out, throw it in your, your trash can. Don't throw it in the compost with all those aphids on it. Plant some more uh, nasturtiums and you'll keep having this cycle that keeps going, attracting the aphids off of the plants you want to harvest and not the plants that you don't care so much about. One of my favorite cool season crops are peas. Now peas, uh, they don't have a lot of pests per se. They get a lot of disease. Uh, mildew for fusarium wilt. Mildew can be kept at bay by keeping the leaves dry if possible. I know it rains in the winter here at least. It rains some, some other places too, but uh, usually if it's you know not too wet outside all the time, peas are gonna be pretty good until the weather starts warming up in early spring and that's when you're going to see a lot of mildew issues uh, fusarium wilt is another one that peas get and there's actually a few things that you can plant with the peas that will help keep uh, diseases like fusarium wilt at bay or even completely gone you can plant mustard and hairy vetch between the rows of peas and research has actually shown that plants grown in association with these two uh, actually have a lower rate of diseases like fusarium wilt. One of the workhorses of my winter garden, fall garden, cool season garden are lettuces, lettuces and greens. I mean, we really can't grow them at any other type of time of year. So I pack the most of those into the garden. So we have fresh salads throughout the whole cool season. Um, some are not so much right now. There's no way I could grow lettuce with 90 degree temperatures, but in the cool season, they're right at home. Lettuce is a lot of times attacked by cutworms and aphids and flea beetles. Studies actually show that planting alyssum among your lettuces um, keep aphids away. And they actually look great growing together also. Alliums like onions and garlic and shallots and chives, they are actually, they repel aphids. Not all the time. I know I've heard from some of you say your garlic gets more aphids than your lettuce. There's always going to be exceptions to the rule, but research has shown that these plants, because of the scent that they give off, do tend to repel aphids. And what's great about these bulb crops like garlic and onions is they, um, they're a little bit deeper rooted than lettuce. Lettuce is a very shallow rooted, so they're not going to compete for the same moisture, for the same nutrients. So they are great to plant together and they're going to repel the aphids. It's also a great space saver. Think of planting a bed with, you know, onions and garlic intermixed with lettuce and alyssum. You've got a winning combination. Another bulbing crop that's great to plant with lettuces are radishes. Radishes like the same conditions as lettuce, uh, but they repel flea beetles. And so those will keep the flea beetles away from your lettuce while at the same time growing perfectly in harmony with the lettuce itself. Now, while we're talking about alliums, garlic is, um, we just talked about as a companion plant, but as a crop, it doesn't tend to have a lot of pests. Using the comp companion planting uh, characters or plants that I just mentioned, especially alyssum and cosmos. Cosmos and alyssum planted with garlic are gonna repel the main pest of garlic, which is thrips. Thrips is the main problem with garlic. And that's a little bug that's very tiny, that's gonna leave long strip-like uh, dead marks on your garlic leaves. And in a bad infestation can kill the plant. If you plant alyssum, which we already talked about planting with garlic, uh, and cosmos, that's going to attract, again, the parasitic wasps who will take care of the thrips. Carrots are a great, fun, cool season crop to grow. It's always fun to pull those carrots and actually see what's been developing underground. Unfortunately, the carrot fly will come by and ruin that fun. Carrot fly lays eggs in the soil next to the carrot root itself, and that little larva will burrow its way into the carrot root, deforms the root, eats the root, sometimes can kill the plant. The carrot root itself uh, and the leaves have a very strong carrot scent. You can smell it, and that is what the carrot fly is looking for. It's It's got a nose that can search out carrots, and so you want to disguise the carrot smell. A great way to do that is with a hedge of chives. Chives make a great hedge. They're beautiful. They've got really pretty flowers on them, and that chive smell bordering your bed of carrots is going to confuse the carrot fly 
and possibly have them fly to the neighbor's carrot patch who doesn't know the trick about planting chives around their carrots. Interspersing carrots with other plants is another way to do that, to just cause confusion. Pests aren't that smart. I mean, we got to be smarter, right, as humans than little bugs. So let's just outsmart them. Carrots, actually, if you leave a few in the garden and let them go to flower, they're going to attract a lot of beneficials that will stick around for the summer crop. Things like lacewings, and again, wasps, ladybugs, hoverflies. So let a few of those carrots go to flower. They're really pretty. Or plant something that's like a flowering carrot, like a Queen Anne's lace. All the companion planting strategies we've talked about are going to take care of 90% of all of your pests and disease at this time of year. So make sure, you know, instead of monocropping, long fat rows of one type of crop, intersperse things, keep it mixed up so that you confuse the bugs. They're easy to confuse. All we have to do is just a few simple things. So I think just the main idea from this video has to be interplanting with cosmos, dill, fennel, uh, alyssum, nasturtiums, flowering carrot, Queen Anne's lace, all of these things are going to help keep your plants pest and disease resistant throughout the cool season. The, the, the upcoming warm season after that is a bit of a different story. We have a whole, whole other line of arsenal uh, companion plants for that. I'll do more videos next year. You can go look at the ones from last spring. I'll link them down below. Other than that, I think that pretty much covers it. Doing those things are really going to help you out. And don't forget to subscribe to our newer channel, Next Level Homestead, where I'm gonna be getting into taking this one and a half acres of new property, blank slate, and transforming it into the homestead gardens of my dreams. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps push this video out to a wider audience. I would really appreciate it. Hopefully the wider audience would appreciate it as well. And uh, I will see you next time.